Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining Dorsey Ross on this episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. In this episode, Dorsey interviews another special guest that will give you hope and inspire you. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining me on another episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. Today, we have a special guest with us. His name is David Libby. Him and his wife, Lisa, raised their two daughters, Kayla and Bethany, in rural Ming. They hunted, fished, and forced for wild edible plants, went camping in remote and undiscovered places, grew gardens, raised livestock, and homeschooled um, home, and homesteading mom and uh, and he and David with a self employed logger as an unintended conse- consequence of this lifestyle. They were bitten by dozens of ticks. About the time out their girls were in their mid teens, the whole family had become desperately ill with Lyme disease, along with a host of complications. For years, he served in the church, first as a deacon and then as an elder. David had been a long self taught student of theology and philosophy. He had learned all the correct answers to some of the most difficult questions and can hold his own as a Christian apologist and a theologian. When his family's health fell apart, he discovered something that the books do not teach, that there is a sharp disconnect between an encyclopedia of that knowledge in the I'm sorry, in the, of encyclopedia of head knowledge and an application of the knowledge in the muddy and bloody trenches. And it is there that this book was conceived. David, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, thank you for having me, Dorothy. I'm very glad to be here. Absolutely. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself and You know, what made you write this book? Well, um, I wrote the book because um, of the experience we had with this, you know, very serious illness and having to grapple with the tough questions. And I thought that perhaps, you know, the conclusions that I had come to might be helpful for other people who are also suffering. But, you know, suffering was very difficult for a very long time, and it really forced me to you know, kind of dig deep in some of the some of the very difficult questions. Right. Tell us a little bit about you know your struggles and what you know what you dealt with. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so the physical struggles were uh, very serious illness that included uh, you know the girls feeling sick all the time, but also severe pain all throughout their bodies. My wife described the pain as feeling like there were shards of broken glass all throughout her body. Uh, they were debilitated at times, um, you know, couldn't walk at times, severe seizures, even mental health problems, psychotic episodes, and a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of, kind of just gives a, a little sketch of the, of the physical, you know, physiological problems. But then there, then there were the philosophical problems and theological problems. And those would be, you know, questions like, if there is a God who is good and all powerful, then, you know, couldn't he stop this? And you know, why, why are these kinds of things happening? And, you know, why is there suffering in this world? And I'm, uh, I start out the book by grappling with a question that, that uh, some of the atheists from the uh, 19th century grappled with, uh, uh, Ernst Haeckel, um, a contemporary of Charles Darwin's, um, coined what he called the, the dysteleological argument. You know, the, the teleological argument argues that, you know, the world appears to be designed, therefore it must have a designer, right? Um, he said, well, if that's true, then the designer must not be the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible doesn't make mistakes. And look at the world, it's full of mistakes. So the book kind of starts there. How do we grapple with that question? How do we answer that question? And then it moves on from there. Or actually, it starts out telling my family's story. But once I get into the section, you know, the third chapter, that's where it begins with Heckel's question. 
Now, all those issues that you described, you know, a little while ago. Yeah, sort of. Came yep. from, um, you know, Lyme, di- the, Lyme disease? The Lyme disease was kind of the, the, the trigger for a whole lot of problems, but there were other complications as well. And a big piece of the puzzle was a genetic mutation that my wife and both daughters have, but I don't have, which um, is why it was very easy for me to treat the disease and very difficult for them. And what this mutation does is that it kills the body's ability to deal with toxins. And so they were suffering not only from from Lyme disease, from what the you know Borrelia spirochetes do do to the body, but also they were suffering from all the toxins that you know we breathe in and that are in our food and that are on our clothing, and because the Lyme had kind of helped shut down the body's ability to deal with these toxins and to and to process them. So it was complicated. It was complicated and very hard to treat, and it took a lot of years and a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, oh, I'm sure, and I know mm, that uh, okay. that experience as well. How did you come to the answer of you know is there a God and, and why would God allow you guys to to go through that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. And so, uh, initially, the you know the first, I guess, there'd be several parts to the answer that I would give, and. The first part of the answer would be that Ernst Haeckel, with his with his dis- teleological argument, and he actually borrowed it from David Hume a century earlier, but um, his, his argument really is is kind of a, a foolish one because because God has promised us that there would be trouble in this world. You know, we 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 read in Genesis three that God has cursed his creation because of human rebellion, because of sin, and as a result, there is pain and suffering. You know, because of God's curse, so so Ernst Haeckel's argument really um, is kind of goes like this: um, Don't uh, uh, don't things like suffering prove that there is no God? Well, no, they don't prove that at all because God told us that there would be suffering. You know, God ordained that there would be. So, you know, um, for example, imagine you know, imagine Eve um, having just given birth to her first child and saying, "Wow, you know, that really hurt. That must prove there is no God." Well, no, God told her that you're going to have pain in childbirth. So it doesn't disprove God at all. In fact, it's 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 part of the design. But then, of course, that doesn't answer all of our questions. You know, God could take our trials away. Why didn't He ordain a reality where there are where there was no fall into sin? And you know, we, we can always push back against those those answers. But uh, I think that there are good answers in Scripture. Um, God ordained the reality that we have for His glory. God is glorified um, in a display of His justice and you know, where would we have an occasion for that display if there were no sin? And he's glorified in the, in the display of his mercy and grace. Um, if there were no need for redemption, we wouldn't have this, you know, beautiful display of mercy and grace. And a fall into sin and suffering gives God the occasion to display his his love in profound and amazing ways, you know, in, in the atonement and in redemption. But, you know, we, we can still push back against those answers as well. But the end of the line answer, I believe, is found in, in the end of the book of Job. And in Romans nine verse twenty and, and elsewhere, and that answer would be, uh, "He is God and I'm not." You know, at some point I need to be contented with a, you know, with, with an acceptance acceptance of what is. You know, <laughs> this is the reality that He has ordained, even if I don't understand why, even if all the why questions aren't answered. And and also, by the way, Scripture gives us good um, answers to a lot of our why questions. Not all the why questions, but a lot of them. You know, we're told in Scripture that we're sanctified through trials and afflictions. You know, Scripture uses the analogy of a fuller's soap, you know, scrubbing off all the, you know, pollution of sin, but also the analogy of a refiner's fire. You know, the silver and the gold are, are refined in the fire. And so it's in the fires of affliction that we we find this sanctification and this refining. And, you know, it seems to me that people who really true, truly do love the Lord Jesus are, are, are drawing closer to him in times of trial. Uh, so, you know, there are, there are good answers in Scripture, even if all the answers aren't you know, given. Right. What would you say to people who are going through trials and going through difficulties, but they're questioning God, they're, they're questioning God of, you know, why would you allow this to happen? You know, they may even be like, you know, God, you know, you told me that, yes, there would be trials, but you didn't tell me how bad these trials would would be, you know? 
So I'm not going to, you know, I'm tr- trying to trust in you, uh-huh. but the doctors are telling me, are telling me X, Y, Z, you know, what would you say to those, to those people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's um, a very good question, a very important question. And, and it's not all hypothetical, is it? Because those things really do happen. They happen every day. Um, and what I would say to that person is, um, I guess it depends on why the person's asking. If the person is is doubting the, ex- the existence of God because of these trials, I would say, well, no, the trials actually demonstrate that there is a God because he said there, there would be trials. But if the person is believing in God, but just, you know, asking why me, uh, then I would say uh, I would be very, very sympathetic, first of all, because, you know, I, I've been there myself and um, it's awful easy to not be suffering in the, you know, spout out the right answers. But when you're really there, it's, it's hard. So I would be very sympathetic, um, but I would tell the person to to focus on what you know to be true. Uh, what you know to be true is what is taught in God's Word. Um, you know, for example, a, a beautiful example is in um, uh, is it First Corinthians, or second, either First or Second Corinthians, I forget which uh, chapters four and then a chapter chapter five. We have this you know beautiful beautiful discourse where Paul you know talks about. Uh, trials and afflictions and you know we're 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 uh, you know beaten down but not crushed and so forth and 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 he says that that our momentary light affliction you know here in this life is actually uh contributing to or storing up or making a contribution to uh an eternal weight of glory in the life to come so i guess i would tell that person to try to focus on getting through the next minute you know don't look at the big picture but you know, just hang on, and uh, as you're hanging on, be sure there is purpose behind it. God is using these trials for His glory and for your good. It's hard to accept that in the midst of the trials, isn't it? But God's word tells us that's true, and so we can trust in that. Yeah, but it is hard. Yeah, it is. And like, and like you said, you just said, you know, you know, think about today, or wait, you know, think about this moment. Don't worry about you know tomorrow. And that's, you know, that's exactly what the Bible right. says. The Bible says, hey, you got enough trouble of it going today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't yep. worry about next week or next month when, you know, several months down the road. That's right. Yeah, well said. Yeah, that you're, you're exactly right. Uh, my, my daughter Bethany used to say that, you know, when she was really, really suffering, she used to say that one um, great comfort that she held on to was the fact that every minute that passes is a minute that will never have to pass again. So, you know, focus on getting through the, you know, the next few steps. You know, you, you mentioned it a little while ago, and but how is it that a God who, who cannot make mistakes has made a world full of mistakes? Yeah, right, right. Yep, that's that's Ernst Haeckel's disteleological argument, and that's which he borrowed from David Hume a century earlier. And my answer is, and you know, by the way, there are a lot of answers that we find by by well-meaning Christians. I don't mean to put them down in any way, but there are a lot of answers that I don't, I don't believe are adequate answers. Um, I think the the correct answer is that he hasn't made any mistakes. The uh, trials and afflictions are not a mistake. You know, they're all part of his sovereign plan, woven together, you know, for a divine purpose. And um, if God were not a sovereign God, that wouldn't be possible. But He is a sovereign God. You know, God's word tells us that very clearly. So, my answer would be there are no mistakes. You know, p- pain and suffering aren't mistakes. They're all part of God's sovereign plan. Amen. And what would and you know, I guess it goes along with what you just said. You know, for people with disabilities, you know, we'll, we'll do that as an example. You know, for people like myself who have disabilities. And you know they, you know we may talk to them about mm-hmm. God, and we may tell them about God, and you know they may say, well, you know, if God is perfect and God doesn't make mistakes, you know, why would He, you know, why would He allow me mm-hmm. to be born? You know, would you say the same thing that that you know, obviously God doesn't make mistakes, but how would you expound on that on that question to? Someone with a disability. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, again, I would be very, very sympathetic, of course, but um, I would say that first of all, if the person doesn't believe in God, then I would say your your disability is no evidence against his existence. 
you know, because God's word tells us that this is what we ought to expect in this world. You know, what, what you're saying is uh, if, uh, if there were a God, this wouldn't happen. But the God who exists, in, the one in the scripture, says that it will happen. So, so it's no evidence against his existence. But if the person is someone who believes in God, if the person is a Christian, then I would say uh, try to change your perspective, change your focus. Uh, your, uh, y- you could even look at the disability or the suffering um, as a privilege because it's it's giving you the opportunity to glorify God in ways that you wouldn't have otherwise. Okay, so uh, think of it this way. If, if uh, life or God, you know, gives us circumstances that that would uh, give the unbeliever grounds, you know, to shake his fist at God and, and, and curse God, but instead we love God all the more and we remain faithful to him, then we have glorified him in ways that we could not have done if we didn't have the disability or if we didn't have the suffering. So um, I would say first, you know, trust in, in a sovereign God. He's given us what um, is, is, is best for his glory and for our good and, you know, glorify him in it and, and know that you have the you have the occasion to glorify him in ways that you wouldn't have if you you know didn't have the disability you know i'm i'm reminded of the man in scripture who uh in the book the gospel of john i forget which chapter but uh the man who was born blind and the lord jesus healed him and the disciples asked was it because of this man's sin or was it because of his parents sin that he was born blind and jesus probably shocked them with his answer he said neither he was born blind so that god would be glorified when i heal him so right. uh you know, he suffered with blindness all that time so that God would be glorified. And so if we have a, a self-centered perspective, we might say, well, that's not fair. You know, why would, you know, God glorify himself, but he made me suffer in the process. But if we have a God-centered focus, we then we say, wow, what a privilege. I, mean, I, you know, I, 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 I was born blind so I could glorify God. What an awesome privilege. So a, a different perspective, I think, is 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 would be in order. Yeah. Well, for myself, you know, I had I've had sixty eight operations over my over my lifetime. You know, I grew up in the church and you know gave my life to Christ at the age of oh, wow. thirteen. And you know, back in two in, um back in two thousand eight, mm. I started traveling around sharing my story. You know, because that's you know exactly what you're saying that God allowed me to be born this way because I can glorify Him and travel around and share my share my story yes right and that actually right that that you actually added to my answer and you added to it beautifully because um in in your case you might not have had that opportunity to share you know your story to speak to as many people as you do um if it hadn't been for the disability so he's opened up beautiful opportunities uh, in this life as well um so yeah amen brother yeah uh, very well said right that's a lot of that's a lot of operations, brother. Sixty eight operations. Wow. Is it a biblical worldview inconsistent with science? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> there are those who would like to like to to think that, aren't there? Um, but no, not not at all. Uh, in fact, I would argue. <clears throat> so, you know, I I, I love philosophy, and I. I'm actually um, ready, about to launch another book that I've finished writing that gives a philosophical defense of Christian faith. It's not available yet, but should be available soon. But um, so I guess I would answer that question in two ways. First of all, by pointing out that that you know real science done well has never made a single discovery that that contradicts a biblical worldview in any way. Um, in fact, I think there's a lot that's been discovered that supports a biblical worldview. But I would answer in, in another way as well. I would say that uh, we're going to get into a little philosophy here, a little, little heady stuff here, but um, that uh, science depends upon induction. And induction depends upon you know things like the uniformity of nature, trustworthiness of the senses, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, We need to have a solid foundation for empiricism and so forth. You know, a lot of fancy-sounding lingo there, but, but I would argue, and I'm not going to get into details as to why unless you want me to, but... I would argue that we can't have any of those things without God. Those things all depend upon God. So science would not be possible, I would argue, if there were no God. You know, without God, we can't, you know, we don't have any reason to believe in uniformity of nature. Well, with God, we do, because God tells us so. Uh, you know, without God, we don't have any any uh, reason to 
you know, believe that um, empiricism is, is a sound foundation. Empiricism is simply the philosophy that says that that truth is determined by what we experience. But how do we know our experience is even real? Well, we know that because God tells us so in his word. So, so with God, we have a solid foundation for science. Without God, we don't have a solid foundation for science. And I love science, by the way. To add on to that, to the next uh, question, isn't it, it, excuse me, isn't it a bit a bit past A to still have faith in the age of mm-hmm. reason? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, I would answer that a couple different ways. Again, we'll get into a little philosophy here. Uh, first of all, I would argue that every worldview position depends upon faith on some level. Okay, so So nobody can say, I don't have faith. Um, the uh, atheists, for example, you know, atheists love to talk about how they don't have faith; they have reason. Um, but their whole worldview is built on a foundation of faith. You know, they, their their whole worldview is naturalistic. They don't believe in any spiritual realm. They don't believe in God. They all they believe is they believe in matter. You know, matter in, in motion, matter and energy, and and there's nothing more to reality than that. But how do you know? How do you know that there is nothing more to reality than 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 matter? And, um, energy and so forth, and uh, they they can't know. They can't know. They have to accept that on blind faith. So, so every worldview, you know, we could talk about other worldviews as well. But you know, I picked on the atheists, but we could pick on anybody. Uh, every worldview depends upon faith on the foundational level. So, so no, it's not passe to have faith. We all have faith. You know, the, the question is, what is the object of that faith? And then also. I would answer that question another way, you know, in an age of reason, isn't it, you know, passe to have faith? I would argue that that reason could not exist without, you know, absolute norms or, or laws or, or rules that govern right and wrong thinking, rationality. So, you know, think of it this way. It's, it's, it's impossible for your thinking to go off the rails unless there actually are rails to go off from, you know, and, and how do you justify the existence of absolutes, absolute laws of rationality without an absolute lawgiver. You know, we could spend a lot more time, you know, teasing that out. But um, I would argue that uh, you can't. You can't justify absolutes of rationality without an absolute lawgiver. And that absolute lawgiver has to meet certain conditions, certain preconditions. He he has to be uh, personal. He has to be, you know, transcendent, uh, sovereign and immutable and so forth. And we could go on. And the those preconditions are met only in the God of the Bible. So, so I guess what I'm getting to is, um, not only is it not, not, not only is it not unreasonable to believe in God, there can't be any such thing as reason without God. You know, reason depends upon God. So, so really, reason depends upon our faith. You know, the Christian faith being true. Without you know, without the Christian faith being true, there can't be any norms or, or laws or standards by which rationality is defined. And without that, you don't have any such thing as reason. So reason depends upon God. Uh, I think it was the um, the great um, theologian, uh, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, Aurelius Augustine, who said, you know, I'm paraphrasing somewhat, but he said something like, uh, I I believe so that I may might know. You know, I, I have faith so that I can have knowledge. Um, you know, we can't have reason without God, I guess is the point. So how do we deal with people that say that Christianity is a crook for the weak and, you know, that that don't that don't cope with the sinful reality of sinful side of reality? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. I love that question. That was um that was the philosopher Sigmund Freud's argument. He you know he argued that uh, you know, Sigmund Freud looked at at, at the uh, world and, and humanity and world history and said, wow, you know, if, everywhere I look in world history, people are religious. They believe in gods or a god or, you know, some kind of religion. So how do we account for that if, if there is no god? And his, you know, the, the, the theory he came up with was, well, people uh, have a hard time coping with these, you know, harsh realities of life that they, you know, that are outside of their control. And so we invent some God that we can appeal to, and you know, for example, that you know, ancient people didn't know how to deal with the the uh, tidal wave or the volcano or the hurricane. So, so you invent a god of the hurricane. Now you, we can you know pray to him or offer sacrifices to him and so forth. Uh, so, 
Freud would argue that the God was non-existent. He was made up. And of course, in, in, in most cases, that's true. Uh, but then he applied that same theory to the God of the Bible. He said that uh, in, in modern times, you know, what's our, you know, what's the greatest, you know, harsh reality we can't cope with? Well, you know, death, you know, dying, ceasing to exist. You know, he believes that if we die, we're, we're gone and that's it. Um, so we've invented this, this crotch, you know, this, this false God that says, or this false religion that says, Hey, when you die, you're not gone. You get to go on, live eternally, you know, see your loved ones again. And he said, that's, he said, that's not true. It's just a crotch. It's a crotch for weak-minded people who can't deal with the harsh reality that when you're gone, you're gone. Okay. So here's how I would answer that. I would say, Mr. Freud, I, I personally don't find the prospect of dying and ceasing to exist to be all that frightening. You know, if, uh, if, if I ceased to exist, I wouldn't even know I'd cease to exist because I wouldn't exist. You know, it's, it's not that big a deal to me. But what is a big deal is dying and coming face to face with a just and holy God. Uh, so maybe Mr. Floyd is putting the crutch on the wrong foot. You, you know what I mean? He's, you know, he's uh, m- maybe maybe he can't handle right. the harsh reality that, that, that what he does here in this life does matter. It matters eternally. And one day he's going to stand before a just and holy God, and he can't handle that. So he's invented this crutch, this false religion called atheism, you know, to to avoid having to, you know, deal with that harsh reality. So I, I think that he's the one who's who's using a psychological coping mechanism, not us. Uh, let, let me tell a little story about that that uh, I think illustrates that point pretty well. I I um, up here in Central Maine a few years ago, I was leading a a a tour, a, a foraging day where we were, you know, taking a group of people around and foraging for wild edible plants and showing them which kind of plants they could eat, which ones they couldn't and what to do with them and what time of year to pick them and that sort of thing. And I went into the area where I was going to do this tour the day before because I wanted to scout out different plants I wanted to be able to feature. And I found a a plant called Japanese knotweed growing in somebody's yard. And I uh, I went and knocked on the door and, and said, hey, can I you know, bring people here tomorrow to look at this patch of plants here. And woman said, yeah, no problem. But she and I talked for a while outside her house. And while we were talking, a turkey vulture soared overhead, you know, went gliding around in circles overhead. And she looked up and said, oh, wow, if there's an afterlife, I want to come back as one of those. So I took the occasion and said, well, there certainly is an afterlife. And we can know that because God's word tells us, but we're not coming back as anything. There's no such thing as reincarnation. And that that led into a discussion about the gospel and about the Bible. Uh, and finally, when the conversation was done, she 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 uh, kind of put the conversation to an end by saying, well, you know what? I believe that when we're dead, we're gone. That's all there is. There's nothing that comes after this life. And then she said, these are her exact words. She said, at least that's my hope. So there she just exposed the fact that that she's hoping that that's her end life hope that there is no God that we are accountable to, and that's the error in Sigmund Freud's argument. You know, he's the one with the crotch, not us. You know, so that that kind of long answer, but that would be my that would be my right. answer to that to yeah. that argument. And he, and even some people, you know, they'll you know twist it and point it back to us and say, well, you know, we're we're the ones that are, you know, making up Christianity. We're the ones that making that are making up the Bible and making up you know, Jesus and him being on this earth, but we know that he was on this, on this earth. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. The, the evidence supporting the Christian worldview is so huge, such a high volume of it that those kind of arguments almost sound silly to me. People still make those arguments, don't they? But to argue that Jesus never existed, never walked on the earth is, is just really, really silly. You know, he's mentioned in a whole lot of extra biblical you know, it's the evidence is just overwhelming. Well, as we get ready to end here, can you give us one last encouragement for our listeners? Yeah, yeah, happy to. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I would encourage all the listeners. Um, well, I guess I would encourage them in different ways. If if listeners are not Christians then I would encourage them to really take a careful, serious look at the Christian worldview. Um, I think you're going to find that it will stand up to scrutiny. Um, and be, don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. So if you're not a Christian, give it, really take a, a careful look at the Christian worldview and 
look at it with this in mind. This is this is the most important decision you can ever make uh, because your eternity depends upon it. You know, if, if if I'm right, the Christian worldview is true. You need to be right with the true and living God, the one God who actually does exist. So for uh, people who are Christians, um, I would say keep fighting the good fight. If you're a sufferer, like my family has been, if you if you're you know suffering trials and afflictions, then keep your eyes on on the Lord. Um, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, he uh, he not only entered this world and suffered with us; he suffered for us. You know, he he suffered more than any man, and he did it for us to pay the penalty for our sins. So you know, keep this in mind as we you know plow forward through trials and afflictions. Uh, we serve a God who loves us. And we serve a God who was ordained whatsoever comes to pass, and he works all things, even disabilities and uh, sufferings and trials. He works them all together for the good of those who love him. So keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. How can people connect with you and, and buy your book? Um, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a technology guy, so the best answer I can give you is one that I give everybody, and they all say, this is an adequate answer. So um, right now it's available on Amazon. I'm hoping to have it available elsewhere eventually, but right now Amazon is the best place to get it. And if you go on Amazon, uh, excuse me, go on Amazon and uh, uh, look up my name or do a search for my name, David Libby, and the name of the book, A Different World. So David Libby, A Different World. People say it's really easy to find. So, um, you, know, you know, I... I'd give a link if I had one, but I, I'm not a technology guy. But people say it's really easy. If you look on Amazon, uh, David Libby, A Different World, you're going to find it easily. So, yeah, thank you, Dorsey. I'll find it and I'll put it in the uh, show notes for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that an awful lot. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, guys and girls, thank you so much for joining us today on another episode of the Dorsey Rush Show. And uh, thank you. David for coming on and sharing your story and until next time God bless, bye bye Thank you again for joining Dorsey Ross on this episode of the Dorsey Ross Show Please like, share and tell others about the show Also, please check out the other podcast episodes and if you would like donate to this podcast and buy Dorsey a coffee Thanks again for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next episode